The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. God is revealing some significant things that have not fully developed yet, so I'm going to throw them out at you and let you pray and develop them. How's that? I like to put a little responsibility on people other than myself. But there, there's some words that God's given us this week, uh, and I want to share these. There's five elements of what he's been sharing. The first element was he basically said, uh, actually, uh, Michael Fickus, when he shared up here, shared a word that is continually coming to the surface. How many were here when Michael was here? Anybody? He's one of the teachers. And he basically said every time it seems like it's going to slow down, something new is going to rise up, like wave after wave. And what God spoke is that we're, we're about ready to crest another wave of God's favor. And so what you do is you yield to it, and it lifts right? If you were on an inner tube or something and a wave came, it would just lift you up as you yield. You didn't fight it. You didn't have to swim. You didn't have to uh, do spiritual warfare. You just yield to what God is doing and it lifts up. So I believe there's a wave of God's favor uh, that's coming. And I'd like to believe that for everyone. Uh, But here's an interesting word that he gave me. The second element that he gave me, besides a wave of God's favor, Uh, being made available, opportunities, spiritual opportunities. He gave me this word fence post. Now, I've been preaching long enough that usually God, when he would speak uh, structures like that, I always got, you know, pillars in the temple. And, you know, you'd have elders that were pillars of the church, et cetera, et cetera, pillars. But he clearly, in our prayer time, I said, Jennifer, this has got so much life on it. He just spoke, I am planting fence posts and spiritual fence posts. These are people fence posts. And not just something that you talk over to your neighbor, but a fence post. Now, I saw with the fence post though, that it, it, as he was saying that he's planting fence posts, I saw several things come in a flurry. The first thing is, is that God's gonna start drawing people to get planted. Believe it or not, there are people that actually, even though they're spirit-filled Christians, there's still a little bit of fear-based, uh, I gotta go everywhere because I'm afraid I'm gonna miss something and never really get planted. But the concept is almost like going to the mall. I can't buy everything from Sears when there's Macy's and Dillard's and Belk's. I mean, I can't, you know. So it's kind of like that mentality, but not really getting clear direction from God. No, that's neither here nor there. The part that God showed me is that there is a percentage, and I've been believing for them for a long time that have never gotten planted. They've been like tumbleweeds in the body of Christ, like Jeremiah 17. But I'm believing that God is going to begin working on fence posts and saying that even those that appear to be planted, do you realize a fence post is of no avail if there is no connection? What would cattle do if there was a series of fence posts, but they weren't connected? (laughs) They would basically ignore it. They say, that's nice and be on with it. I believe that what God was basically speaking is that this is a time and a season for supernatural relationships. I believe not only did my son get married uh, last week, but uh, God was basically speaking on marriages, and he was speaking on covenant relationships, he was speaking on friendships, and he was speaking on the reality and uh, uh, anatomy of relationships. By the way, we have a DVD called Anatomy of Relationships, and this is kind of similar because God's saying that these fence posts are, being, are the planting of the Lord, and the planting of the Lord is individuals need to pay attention to who God's connecting you with because there's good connections and there's bad connections. you believe that? Do you believe there's bad connections? Yeah. 
yeah. And a person who is unconnected is vulnerable to bad connections. I believe that God is saying this is something prophesied to us as a couple uh, in 2007, and here it is, 2014, and I believe it's happening now. That's always exciting for me. But God basically is saying this is the season of the spiritual magnet. This was prophesied to us by Jim Gall in 2007. He basically said that there, the season of the magnet for us would be that the Holy Spirit will attract relationships for the connection and the knitting of the Spirit which you have no control over that. That's uh, the only control you have is to cooperate or not cooperate. But in reality, it's a work of the Holy Spirit and it's to take fence posts and connect them. And he says that basically what a magnet does is it has two, two parts to it, doesn't it? It has the part that pulls and attracts, but it has the part that repels. This is my prayer. I pray for people that they would repel bad relationships and recognize it, because here's the, here's the thing that God showed us that uh, I never liked hearing this. Jennifer started this problem, but she told me that everybody, that meant me while I'm listening to her telling other people, I'm hearing, she said everybody, so that included me. Everybody has blind spots. But it wouldn't be a blind spot if you knew what it was. I don't like that part either. But a blind spot can be easily identified by everyone else. Oh, that should keep us humble. So in other words, I've got blind spots that I can't see, but everybody else can. Oh, great. Huh? But in this season of what God is calling a spiritual magnet, there is opportunities to keep your heart right. He will draw and attract the proper relationships, friendships, marriage, really, whatever, uh, covenant church relationships, business relationship, whatever, whatever is in the plan and purpose of God for your life. There will be attraction, but there will also be a warning for bad relationship. And it will actually make distance. The problem with that is, is that there are predators who, rather than looking for the godly relationship and a redemptive purpose, isn't that our purpose in God, a redemptive purpose, to love God and love people? They will take the blind spot and exploit it, what we call codependency, but it's much more than that. It's actually exploiting an individual's need for relationship. And they will take a bad relationship over no relationship and exploit that weakness by meeting that need. But we want to talk about what a healthy relationship looks like today so that that doesn't exist, okay? So I just want to give a... Uh, so the season of the magnet, I, let me cover the five elements. Uh, that was the third. First, there's a wave of favor, element number one. Number two, he said, I'm bringing living fence posts for planting uh, and to be properly connected. The third element is the season of the magnet to where the Holy Spirit will reveal unhealthy relationships that need to be resisted and healthy relationships that need to be cooperated with and the healthy relationships that you're to cooperate with may not appeal to your likes and dislikes. And that's something. So I mean, we're entitled to preference, but it might not match your preferences. It's gonna be a heart condition and a heart attitude. Now, the fourth element is been spoken for weeks and months now, a heart attitude that is welcoming 
God's presence. We were talking about that Mother's Day and the day before, and the week before that, about uh, people crying out that more Holy Spirit or come Holy Spirit, that there, it needs to be a preparation of the heart to where we're welcoming more of God, don't you? A hunger and thirst for more of a revelation. I don't know about you, but personally, I'm not satisfied with my own Christian walk. I want, I, and I know that where I'm at, I need more Holy Spirit, that it's not about me trying harder. It's going to have to be a great, less of me and more of him. And to that degree, we need more Holy Spirit in our lives. We need uh, that kind of strength. So there's a welcoming as the fourth element that God's been speaking. And the fifth element is I'm enlarging the boundaries. Do you remember, how many know are familiar with Jabez's prayer in the Bible? Lord, that I would not cause pain, increase my boundaries. Well, you know, if you walk in a forgiveness lifestyle, and that becomes part and parcel of, of your attitude, then basically you are enlarging the heart. And when you enlarge the heart, you have the capacity for enlarging the boundaries. But I believe that God's taking these fence posts, he's gonna connect them by the power of the Holy Spirit, whether it's in marriages or friendships, or uh, business or church, and he's going to connect them in such a way that he says there is going to be an arena where my presence can come. And uh, that I can bless. Now, I'm talking about Christians, and it's a habitation of God. And I was mindful of the story. How many have heard the story that Tommy Tenney spoke about the, the older man who was overweight, extremely overweight? Okay, good. <laughs> I like it when you, then they go, no. Uh, I got this story. <laughs> See, but... Uh, Tommy Tenney used to say this years ago, and I believe it's a preparation of where we're at in this season. But he said there was a, uh, an extremely overweight man who would come with his coat and hat, and he would go visit the friend that he loved more than anything else. And he'd visit him. He would open the door, and he'd invite him in, and he was all smiles to see his friend. But he would look around, and he knew that there wasn't a chair that could support his weight. He would never take his hat off, never take his coat off. As much as he loved his friend, he just knew there wasn't a chair sufficient enough to hold his weight. And he would leave very, very sad and reluctant. And that was a picture of what God is looking for a corporate expression. A habitation of God in the spirit is almost like, you could call them fence posts, because God wants to connect together, but you could also look like a chair. All of those spokes, if they're not properly connected and they're not strong enough, they cannot hold the weight of God's presence and what he wants to do. And I believe that what God is looking for is an upper room. He didn't tell us to even plant this church to have church. He told us to birth a church, to create an upper room, and it would be through relationships. And it would, be, it would be like the magnet. There would be people come and go because there's people, even in business and even in ministries. I, I, I've worked for many, many years with ministry heads. When Jennifer and I traveled, that's who we ministered to. We ministered to pastors and business leaders and ministry heads. And you know what? They, they had one common, one common uh, thread is that it was hard for them to find people that really caught the vision and had a loving heart for what they were doing because many came with their own agenda. Many even would shine up, so to speak, to major leaders so that their ministry could be launched from there. When in reality, the ministry leader, if they're building by revelation, if they've got a heavenly vision that came from God, and it's not their own selfish making to be successful, but it's literally in obedience to God, then that vision can be part of other individuals' lives if they catch that vision and feel like this is part and parcel of where my individual identity gets expressed, they become some, a part of something bigger than themselves. And it's not a launching pad for their ministry, but it is a launching pad for destiny. Now listen to this. Destiny always includes people. Success doesn't necessarily have to. I mean in a healthy way. Success includes people, but success can be, I walk all over these people to be a success. 
Destiny, however, is the opposite. Destiny for you and I to fulfill our destiny will always include people. And when they're included in the proper way, then destiny will include success automatically without even seeking it. So where there is successful relationship with God and one another, destiny is fulfilled. But no man's an island, nobody lives unto themselves nor dies unto themselves. But the most difficult thing that we saw in traveling were the pseudo relationships that had an agenda that would exploit the weakness. Like if a ministry leader had a need for a piano player, someone that was a piano player may not necessarily have their heart knit, may not even know what the ministry is about. All they see is me and my gift and my talent. Larry Randolph had a good word this week on Elijah List even. He was saying, don't let your gift interrupt what the Holy Spirit's doing. Do you know how many times, even as a young pastor, I would feel the presence of God increase in the room and they automatically thought that was a signal to prophesy? Just because the presence increased doesn't mean that that's, why not wait and see what God's doing? Not, not that I want to hinder anybody from operating in their gifts either, but at the same time, you can actually get a goosebump and think that's my cue to speak, sing, talk, prophesy, whatever. When in reality, you're supposed to be just making yourself available to God at all moments, regardless of the external environment. You're to be listening to an inter, inner prompting, not an external influence. So, anyway, I want to read this before we begin. This is, that was my introduction, all right? Those five elements, and God wants to enlarge the boundary. When he enlarged the boundary, I saw, I saw a boundary having not just markers, but markers that are connected by living relationship, living cords, like living fence posts with living cords that were connected together. And we'll, we'll, we'll get into the, some of those elements later. But I want to read this portion of scripture out of Ecclesiastes. It's basically, it, my Bible's got the little title over it, the value of a friend. And it says here, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. There's, there's provision in friendship, spiritual provision. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. There's security in relationship. The person that isolates themselves to get their head screwed on, so to speak. Do you have Christian friends that have ever said that? I hope you haven't said that. I got to be alone and get my head screwed on. And when you get alone, you're going to get wacko thoughts. You need someone s grounded, secure, and safe. I mean, I tried that. I laid up one night uh, when, uh, when my boys were young, worried about the kids, and I'm saying, he's going to do this and he's going to do that. I wasn't so much worried about Jason as I was the other one, but nonetheless, I stay up all night. And you know, about halfway through the night with sleep deprivation, you, you get all these conclusions like, I think I'll just kill those kids. <laughs> now, if staying up all night came to that conclusion, it tells me you really should have bounced that opinion off of someone a little more stable than yourself. All right? So... It's true. He that isolates himself seeks his own desires, not necessarily the wisdom of God. All right. So having said that, I believe those five elements that we're, we're going to see them come to pass in the days ahead. We're going to see the wave of God's favor. We're going to see fence posts being planted by the Lord. Then we're going to see them properly connected by relationship, by healthy relationship. And we're going to see the season of the magnet where God by his spirit is going to help us navigate between the cords of love that pull us together relationally and allow opportunity for relationship, freeing relationships, not controlling relationships, but also the repelling part. And the part that over the years when we ministered to leaders, the part that I wanted to see really take place with the repelling so that you don't just get into rejection and start eliminating people, but the repelling needs to be that anyone manipulating somebody's weakness would be exposed. Because that is, to me, the most hideous, malicious, malevolent attitude and should not be a part of any believer. In other words, when a believer is redemptive-oriented and he sees a weakness in someone, you should be looking for a redemptive solution, not 
this is my opportunity to be needed. Anybody that I used to, uh, I had a lot of counselors in all my churches, must attract them, but I would dismiss any counselor is not sent by me that is looking for business. That's a telltale sign. If, if they're so looking to help minister to somebody and not be asked, hmm? like Rick, you have people come to your office and they ask you. That's, to me, that's legitimate. Of course, I know businesses advertise and what have you. But you don't go to your neighbors door to door and say, I notice you're walking a little funny. You need to come to my office. I can fix that. When that happens in the body of Christ, it's seductive and it's wrong. So if God's saying there's a, there's a wave of favor coming, we're going to ride that wave. He said there's fence posts. People planted. Now you do realize there's a large percentage of the church, some, would, some say 46%, that are not planted anywhere because they're afraid they're going to miss something. That's a fear motive. They're basically afraid they're going to miss something, so they're everywhere. They don't know where they live. My friend Sandy Colkin used to say, he says, if you were in an emergency room and the attendants asked you, what is your name, where do you live, and what do you do for a living? And you can't answer that, they keep you. They say, this person is clearly disoriented. And I'm saying in the body of Christ, it should be the same way. Who am I, where do I live, and what do I do for a living? If you can't answer those questions, there's a disorientation. And in some cases, like even codependent relationships, you're so involved in someone else's relationship that you're not doing anything with your own. You don't know, what, you don't know where you live, what you do, or where you belong because you've exploited the weaknesses in other people to feel needed. That's your free part. But God says this is the season of the magnet and that by the power of the Holy Spirit, it's going to bring healthy relationships together and people are going to be equally yoked. Is equally yoked important? Yeah. All right. So those five elements. If you miss those five elements, you have to watch it on Ustream. But those five elements, to me, as far as I'm concerned, they're a thus saith the Lord. They're going to happen. And we're going to see them transpiring before our very eyes. So I want to cover just the, the uh, elements of relationship. First of all, <clears throat> there's three principles uh, in a relationship. And the mission of God, foundationally, fundamentally, is relationship. God created man for relationship. I mean, you can't get any simpler than that. But that relationship is to be found in God, is to have the life of God, the Zoe life of God. He didn't just give you biological life to just wander around. As a matter of fact, when I got saved, that was one of the first visions that God gave me. This is dating me because you won't know what I'm talking about. But in my day, the football game was an electric metal board. And you plugged it in, and the board went, mm -hmm, and you put the little football players on the board, and they would vibrate. Now, I always had ones that were bent on the bottom, and I'd give him the ball, and he's supposed to run this way, and he'd go, mm -hmm, like this, I'm going. And the funny thing is, when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, just Minutes before I got filled with the Holy Spirit, now heavens open, had an open vision. Just minutes before that, I was grieved at why isn't everybody saved? I was saved, but I wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit, and I was grieved. And all of a sudden, I saw the picture of that electric football game, and I'm going, it's like, these people are doing stuff. They're trying to be successful. They're going to school. They're getting an education. They're trying to, but they are so clueless as to where they're going, they're just going, like, I mean, but they're, they're going there. My friend Sandy used to say, uh, people would say, how you doing? They go, fine, uh, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. And he'd say, ask them, where's there? And they go, I don't know, because they figure busy is automatically going to produce something. No, you can go in circles, just like my little football players. I couldn't get them to run down and make a touchdown. Because even if they started to go, there was always a sidetrack to where before they got to the goalpost, they went off. And God's saying, basically, that our safety is that, that there's a liberation coming to the people of God. And 
they're going to have to understand three basic principles of relationship. Are you ready? Principle number one is that the mission of God is relationship. And that means that without a relationship with him, everything else is sort of non-essential. They have to be supernatural relationships. Secondly, every relationship will minister either life or death. Now, before you sit there and start analyzing and say, I'm ministering life and my friend's ministering death before you even go there, all right, I want you to do this. Basically say what the ninth graders did in a survey. Ninth graders took a survey and they all got 100% on their answers. The boys said, boys, when you get married, is that woman going to change you? Across the board, they went, no way, Jose, is any woman going to change me. Across the board, no exceptions. I don't know how big the class was, but I was pretty astounded by that response. On the other hand, the girls across the board, I'm going to change him and make him into the kind of man I think he ought to be. Across the board, we have a serious relational issue here. We have, we have something that must come to grips with this. And so I'm saying, thank God we have Jesus Christ who can answer this dilemma because apparently there is a major inbred dilemma. And it's probably why we see so much struggling in relationship. But God's promised us that this is the season of the magnet. And there's going to be cords of love pulling people together. And there's going to be repelling when it's an unhealthy relationship. Umbilical cords can be a seducing spirit. Hmm? There's wrong connections, right? In the office, in the church, in the home, there can be wrong connections. And two people living under one roof doesn't make a marriage or a relationship. It's kind of some kind of a business merger. But it's not a relationship. Why? Because relationships need to give either life or death. I say choose life. What do you say? Let's choose life. That we minister life. And the third element of this mutual sharing, one, God's got to be in it. Two, it's going to be life or death. But three, we don't like this part because this is where we hide. So now the the veil is being pulled away. You can't hide there no more. The way you treat people is the way you treat God. You can argue with that all you want. The way you treat God is the way you treat people. And you say, I love God, but it's, the, it's those Christians I can't stand. It's not going to hold up. Anyone that says he hates his brother, how can you say the love of God's in you? You treat God. Say that back with me. And if you're watching by Ustream, we've got more watching by Ustream than we have in the room. All right? And people watching on Ustream need to say this. We treat God the way we treat people. Say it. We treat God the way we treat people. We treat people the way we treat God. Ah, oh, is anything surfacing here? Well... All right, those are the three principles. There's three characteristics, though. Are you ready for three characteristics? Those are three principles, and they're across the board. If we're going to have relationship, we need, to, we need to look at it properly, and we need to understand that I believe that even, even now, three characteristics of a relationship is mutuality. Write that word down, mutual, mutual respect. To me, mutual respect is really the way a marriage should be, and it's the way a friendship used to be. As a matter of fact, some marriages could learn from friendships. I see deference in friendships, like two guys. One guy likes to hunt, and the other guy doesn't, but because he's his buddy, go, oh, I'll go with you, reluctantly. There's deference. There's things you will do for your friend that you wouldn't do for your husband or wife. There's something wrong with that. It's interesting that uh, uh, Bob Mumford used to have a little story about the pea revealer. Have you ever heard that story? Good, only Cliff. 
the P revealer was that a young boy knew that his brother didn't like peas and wouldn't eat his peas. And he tried to sneak from eating the peas. And the brother would go, Dad, Johnny's not eating the peas. He would tell on his brother. But his friend would come over and he found out his friend didn't like peas either. And when he saw that his friend didn't like peas, he took his napkin and covered it. A moral of the story is you'll do stuff for a friend that you won't do for a brother. There's some stuff you do for a friend that you won't do for your husband or wife. I say that there's a missing ingredient in our relationships if that mutual respect isn't there. Mutual respect means that basically, and God wants this in the spirit, which we are a body corporately to where each part gives and receives. That's healthy. If it's one way, it's not healthy. I know that I know the vulnerability with one-way relationships. There, it's, there's a vulnerability with one-way relationships because if there is a blind spot or a weakness, there are people that will exploit that blind spot or that weakness to fulfill their agenda. I can remember, I can remember as a real, real young man having a counselee that I was ministering to almost become part of the family when in reality it wasn't supposed to be part of the family but he also knew I didn't have the money to fix the plumbing and he had the know-how so he would literally exploit my need to get an inroad not because of a relationship with me but to have his agenda fulfilled that's not two way and it it actually had me lower my standard to allow that to happen. Rather than trusting God to meet my need, I began trusting in Him to do for me what I couldn't do. But we're entering the season of the magnet where we're going to attract with cords of love, and love frees and love liberates. Love never controls. That's another indication. But we relate to God like we relate to people. The relationship's either going to have life in it or death. If it causes chaos and confusion, that's clearly not God. But the mission of God is relationship. All right, let's get back to the three characteristics. If you're a note taker, you wrote down mutuality. Mutuality means there must be a giving and receiving. Is that scriptural, book of Ephesians? Each part gives and receives. Watch out even for people in the body who give but can't receive. I get red flags when I have someone who's very giving. They want to do everything in the church, but they've never opened up themselves. I don't trust that person because they're giving, but they don't have a need. They, they're, not, they're, they're never vulnerable. I just give. If you can't give and receive, you're not healthy. And sometimes I, we would watch, and over the years, and it would take years sometimes, over the years, some of those people that gave, 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 but would never receive from anybody, we also found out that the way they compensated is they would complain about the people they were helping later. So why'd you do it then? If all you're going to do is, after all I've done for you, what do you mean, after all you did for me? You didn't do it for the right reason or the right motive if that's what you end up saying. When you freely give, you freely give. You give as unto the Lord. But if you say, after all I've done for you, then there's a string attached. The second area, when we're talking about giving and receiving, the second area needs to be understood in light of that. And that is, if you do not touch the other person spirit to spirit, there's no life in the relationship. Hmm? I've watched spiritual women who love God and were rooted in God want to get hooked up with an unsaved guy 
because he'd be a good provider. He may be a good provider, but there's no life in the relationship. You're looking at it from a totally carnal point of view because the key element is spirit to spirit. Do you know how many lonely married people, single people, you need to hear this. You have no idea how many lonely married people there are. And they're lonely because they've never really opened their heart to the other person. They basically have just cohabitate. They basically have like a business agreement. Two people going their own individual ways under one roof. Sharing expenses is the only reason some stay together. Isn't that sad? If you want a real relationship in the kingdom of God, you've got to touch one another by the Spirit. We're called as a body of Christ to know one another according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh. I do not judge people by their actions or their body language. I judge them by the, by the inside, what's going on on the inside, the motives of the heart. By the way, discernment detects the motivation of a human spirit. Not that we understand everybody in their entirety, but you certainly can tell when the motive is bad. If it feels chaotic and confusing, do you think that's God? He's not the author of that, is he? So the third element or characteristic of a relationship, are you writing these down? Tell me what the first one was. Mutual respect. The second one was? must touch in the spirit, spirit to spirit, sharing life. Sharing life means what's flowing back and forth has life on it, not just cutting a deal. It's not just a bartering relationship. You're actually experiencing the life of God back and forth, giving and receiving. I had a question. Somebody uh, texted me. I had a question. They say, Pastor, uh, you you deal with a lot of people. Uh, Do you pray cleansing after you deal with people? No, no, never. I don't get dirty. If I pray with a person that's got a horrific problem, deep-seated root issue, and Christ the forgiver goes to that issue, through that issue, and they get peace, I feel the backwash of a refreshing. I Quite the opposite, I get washed in the water of the word. I feel their release and their freedom blesses me. It's the exact opposite of getting contaminated by them. The only way you can get contaminated by another person is if you're vulnerably open to some shortcoming, really. But these people are always worried about catching something. Greater is he that's in you than he is in the world. If, you're proper, if your heart's proper, you're not going to get stuff. What do we used to say when we, were the, when we were little kids? It was the girls had the cooties. And the guys had to run from the girls because they got cooties. We didn't even know what cooties were, but it, it was something to stay away from because you would obviously get it contaminated. Of course, then you hit your teen years and suddenly it disappeared. All of a sudden, they were, <laughs> they were attractive. They're like, I don't know. I don't know what I was running from them for. Now I want to sit with them in the cafeteria. (laughs) All right. So the three elements is mutuality, meaning giving and receiving, but we're talking zoe. We're talking spiritual life, not just giving and receiving like a bartering relationship. The second one is that if you're not touching in the spirit, you are not having a relationship. It's true with God and it's true with man. As you are to man, you will be to people. But the third element, and this would solve a lot of dilemmas in relationship. Jennifer, come on up here and stand there a minute. I want to, now through the covenant of marriage, Jennifer and I have a relationship. Jennifer has not lost any of her identity by marrying me. I have not lost who I am by marrying her. We didn't just kind of melt into each other and now we're a whole person. No. What God did was supernaturally put the two of us together to make something that never existed before. There is now a new creation as far as the purposes of God that if one can chase a thousand, two, ten thousand. So I got her for security, support. No. But in reality, here's the part that's missing. Right here, and you can't see it, 
is something called a relationship. It's real, but you can't see it. But nonetheless, it's real. She's her person, I'm my person, but we have a relationship. When we minister to people, the tendency is, well, she said, and then she goes, well, you said. That goes nowhere. Did you ever notice that? Nor is, I'm going to make Dennis into the man that I want. And I'm going to say, I want that to her to stay just as sweet as she was on the day that I met her and kissed her for the first time. Both of those are la-la land. <laughs> Marriage is designed to grind. <laughs> but it doesn't end there. The purpose of the relationship is oneness. She needed areas ground off of her, and I need areas ground off of me, but it draws you closer together. You fight not in the marriage, you fight for the marriage. And so any grinding is a good kind of grinding because it draws us closer to each other. There's less barnacles. Otherwise, we're like, all our hurts and our wounds are like, Jennifer and I are both wrapped in barbed wire, and then when we get kind of close, like, Oh, we, we should solve our relationship. Oh, well, you, but, but you don't have to say it like that. You didn't have to do it. It's like we're all wrapped in barbed wire and we poke one another. And as soon as we poke one another, what do you do? You back off. I, no woman's ever going to hurt me like that again. And you can say, no man's going to tell me what to do. We prayed with a lady one time and the Lord rose up and spoke and said, you got a man in your house, Christ Jesus. And she went, oh. <laughs> she was anti-men until God said, I'm a man and I live in you. All right. But here's the part I want you to see. This is the third element. This is what I believe that the, this is the thus saith the Lord, I believe for the season we're in. God says, this is what I'm working on with Dennis and Jennifer and with you. And he says, I'm working on this. So don't try to change that person. That person changed you. This is a relationship of mutual sharing. Now, if I give to Jennifer and she doesn't give back, that relationship is going to be brought to a level and it's going to stay there. Right? And if Jennifer opens up her heart and say, I want to tell you some of my deepest hurts and my deepest wounds. And I go, oh, you did what? Yuck! I would guarantee you she'd go, hey, ain't never telling him nothing again. <laughs> See, the relationship is a real entity just because you can't see it. And what I want to believe is that what happened in that upper room is going to happen in our midst. I want an outpouring, but I want a relationship that's real, even if you can't see it, it's real. And God is trying to do that. Thank you, sweetie. When he builds an upper room, I do not believe that those people were perfect people. I simply believe that the condition of their heart now, don't forget, a lot of people left the upper room. They couldn't wait. I believe that what the ones that left prematurely had an agenda. And the Spirit of God, if I'm yielded to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, I will outlast your agenda if you've got one and you don't die to it. I will outlast you. Because the fruit of the Spirit will remain. Agendas eventually fall. You either yield them or you let them lead you, drive you, and impel you to fulfill some carnal desire that unfortunately doesn't happen. So those three characteristics, mutual giving and receiving, touching in the spirit, and working on the relationship as a separate entity. When Jennifer and I got married, even though she had more confidence in her brother than me, When Y2K came and I said, God's not telling me to prepare. And the prophets were saying, it's going to be worse than you think. Jennifer said, I contacted my lawyer brother and he's done research and he says it really could be very, very bad. And I said, so you're going to believe me or your brother? And she says, I've known him longer. He's got a track record. I, I just married you. That's a legitimate thing in a relationship. She's going, I'm getting my second opinion from my brother, especially when her brother's mission in life as a little boy was to take care of his sister. So I had to wage war on that. I didn't like that one. 
But then as soon as God started showing up, and I'm saying, Jennifer, this is what God's saying, within one year's time, I trumped her brother. But it required proof relationally, not mental convincing. By the way, Jennifer says, anybody want a can of cheese powder? We've got all kinds of provisions from Y2K and we still have them down in our pantry. <laughs> I don't know what we're, someone ought to make something with that cheese powder. It's been there a long time. But I really believe that where, where God's taken us right now is a very good place. And that we're going to start dealing with this this thing here because God says I want a habitation of God in the spirit I want not perfect people but I want people that don't have an agenda when we minister to pastors and leaders around the country the, the one sad thing was they saw that what they were called to do as a leader was a vision that came from God they didn't pick it they knew God called them to do something just as I, I know that God called us to do it. And he gave me what he called me to do when I was still a baby Christian, didn't even understand it altogether. But when I was called to do it, the desire is that that vision is caught and that destiny will be the people that catch that vision, finding their fulfillment in fulfilling that vision, vision of the house, family mission. That's family. And in that context, though, every leader we ever dealt with says, I know who the family is and I know those who have an agenda and they're just looking to advance their own ministry. So there's, there's a distinctive difference and understanding that this is the time to die to agendas but for relationship purpose, deal with your issues. And remember, as much as we don't like it, everybody's got a blind spot. Say that. I've got a blind spot. I've got a blind spot. Everybody sees it but me. Now we're all humble. If that doesn't humble you, I give up. That is so humbling. However, I'm going to have quality relationships, friends that will tell me the truth, so that if anybody exploits my blind spot, they will give it to me right between the eyes. So I better be careful. Hmm? Iron sharpen iron. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Mm -hmm. husbands and wives it's not, a, it's not a business arrangement God said that there's going to be marriages and friendships and there's going to be posts that are going to be planted and God is going to take cords of love and connect those posts and create a chair or a jurisdiction to hold the weight of God I believe we've all got that overweight friend and his name is Jesus, and he really carries a lot of weight. As a matter of fact, the, the kabod in the Hebrew and, and the uh, uh, um, doxe in the Greek mean, if you put them together, it means God wants to throw his weight around. I want him to throw his weight around with me. Don't you? So, Father, we just pray. If you're watching by Ustream, that God would throw his weight around with you. But learn the, that we are in an age of relationship. And the way we relate to people is the way we relate to God. The way we relate to God is the way we relate to people. And that relationship is a separate entity. And we're going to deal with our issues and die to our agendas. And God's going to build something beautiful called a habitation of God in the spirit. And that we are living stones. A habitation of living stones, but true relationship demands mutual respect, eyeball to eyeball. And true relationship demands that life flows. There has to be a give and a take. It can't be a sickly neediness on the part of one. It needs to be life that gives and receives. And lastly, we have to treasure this relationship and work on the relationship. I saw people with deep deep sexual issues, get married, deal with their sexual issues, both male and female, and because they worked on the relationship, had better marriages than a lot of people I know who didn't work on their relationship at all. The word of the Lord is relationships are worth working at. Amen? Amen. And 
The magnet needs to repel us from unhealthy relationships, and we need to be honest enough to know when it's healthy and when it's not. And God can do the impossible. But there's nothing impossible. Nothing is impossible with God. So even nothing is a good thing. All right? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Say hello to somebody. Start a relationship. (laughs) Hug somebody. Really, really go off the deep end. (laughs) You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.